And we're rolling. I think this one works. Actually, you guys can hear me all right? Yes. yes. Excellent. I'm going to declare this uh, meeting open. Um, I'm Andrew Dubber. I work at uh, Birmingham City University in the UK, and uh, I also have a little uh, organisation called New Music Strategies, which started life as a blog telling people about creative ways in which they could survive and thrive in the music industries. But every man and his dog now has a blog about how you can do that for independent music. So we changed slightly, and now we just organise things that we think are interesting about music. And uh, uh, we're working on a book project at the moment, and we've been doing uh, online projects with uh, uh, music organisations that uh, use music as a tool for social change, and, and various bits and pieces like that. But our, our strap line is more music by more people in more places, and that's kind of what we're working towards. Uh, so I've been asked to chair a panel uh, called Creative Ways to Make Money in the Music Industries, and uh, we have three panellists, um, one of which isn't here yet, but we're still hopeful, we have our fingers crossed. Um, but I have with me, uh, on my left, you're right, John Dyer from uh, Domino Records, uh, which you will know from uh, certain artists like Arctic Monkeys, Dirty Projectors, Animal Collective, and others that you will no doubt see uh, over the course of Primavera. And on my right, uh, I have with me Simon Raymond, who's from uh, Bella Union, uh, which you'll know from Beach House, Concrete Knives, Walkman, Andrew Bird, Fleet Foxes, and my favourite, Lawrence Arabia, uh, who's a fellow countryman. Um, There's no one here will have heard of. I hope you will come to learn of uh, Lawrence Arabia. And particular, are you anything to do with the uh, uh, Fabulous Arabia project? No. Oh, that's a shame. <laughs> Fabulous Arabia is great, but Lawrence Arabia, a wonderful artist. Anyway, these guys uh, work in record labels, run record labels, I think it's fair to say. Uh, of an independent nature. Uh, and so this topic of how to creatively make money in the music industry is an interesting one to put to a record label, uh, because my understanding of record labels is, no matter how creative you get about distribution or promotion or, or whatever, how you make money is you sell people records. Is that fair to say, John? I suspect that's what it's based upon, uh, historically. Um, Let's use this mic, it seems to be more Sorry. functional. <laughs> Do you want to try it again? Or not? Try that one. This one also. Oh, you should not try that. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I ask myself that question a lot. Of what, what, do, uh, what is a record label meant to be uh, now and going forwards? And I suppose I've, I've sat in similar rooms like this for the last nine or ten years, and I find them really useful to come and see which bits everyone sneers at when I talk about things, and which bits everyone sort of, you know, there's a little bit of nodding. I've become quite a good observer of little sneers and little nods. And so it, it feels to me that labels are still incredibly relevant, but obviously they have to be very swift in changing the way that they work, and, and then in our case, uh, put artists right at the centre of what we do, and uh, try and anticipate and create services, if you like, um, for our artists. So that might mean in, we might have less people concentrating on physical sales, and that might now mean we have more people concentrating on synchronizations, you know, music into, into programming. So, so there's a shift there. Sam, would you say similar to you? Or try, try this microphone, that seems to be... How is this? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, well, well, my route into to, to, uh, being, being here running a label is quite a strange one. Um, I started as a musician in, in a band called Cocteau Twins, and uh, we were signed to another for, another independent called 4AD. And the you know the idea of running a record label with what in my first the first half of my life seemed seems even still today fairly preposterous. Um, and the idea of running a record label to make money. Uh, coming from a band that made none um, seems seems a bit alien to me and, and obviously for the first few years of running Bell Union uh, with very little business knowledge gained from anywhere other than talking to other people in record labels because you have to remember when I started Bell Union there was there was pretty much no internet um, you know uh, I find it a quite an interesting situation in 2012. Um, like John said, uh, our, our business model has had to change quite dramatically over the last four or five years with streaming being something that people seem, seem happy with. Um, 
personally, I'm not crazy about it because I grew up listening to uh, listening and buying physical products. So I haven't given up on physical physical product yet. Um, I still buy vinyl myself. I wouldn't. Uh, I don't really buy records digitally. All Bella Union products come with a CD, and all all Bella Union vinyl comes with a CD inside. So I'm still sort of glued to physical product uh, until somebody tells me that I can't do it anymore. I will, and every single release we put out comes out on vinyl. So I'm I'm still a luddite in the sense, uh, although I have to appreciate that there are uh, other revenue streams that um, are becoming more and more important. Can I just uh, ask you a quick question about the uh, the cocktail twins days? Because you said as a band who made no money, and I just did a kind of rough mental calculation. I personally spent around about two hundred and fifty quid on cocktail twins records, paraphernalia, t-shirts. Who got that money? Martin Mills, are you in the room? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he's here. Oh, what, what's different now about what record labels can do in a way that well, we musicians can, we can, can get we, money? We can give our artists really good record deals, and we can be fair. Um, I think that as an artist, the deal that, that we had was, was, in today's world, incredibly unfair. Um, I, I certainly don't believe in my, in my label. We, I don't own, we don't own masters. I don't believe in it. So I just license product from the artists for a short period of time. That's that's what I feel is the right thing to do. Does that help you make money, or does that get in the way of you making money? I think, and I'll say it, I've said it a million times before, that the, 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 you make money not necessarily by owning something forever and ever, by having a, having really great bands. You know, and it's, it's, I think it's really down to the quality of the artist that you work with. Um, I mean, listen, Martin Mills is no idiot. He's, he's, he's got 150 odd staff all around the world. Um, he has his fingers in, uh, in some of the best independent labels in the world. He's an incredibly successful businessman, but it's a different model to the one I want to pursue. I don't want to run an empire. I, I like having four staff. It's just me and three friends, and, and that's it. I don't want to expand, and I don't want to become a huge record label. I really like the small part, because I think that's what the artists that we attract desire. The fact that they can have a, you know a small a, a close relationship with one or two people rather than um, several fractious relationships with, with different people. Does scale help? Because Don knows what the, the biggest independent record label, one of the biggest. No, no. Um, I think we I, I think we like to say we're the most important actually. <laughs> <laughs> Other than what um, we like to say, it's not the other. Is, is, um, are, well, you, are you one of the biggest? And we are one of the biggest, which is a shame, really. Um, in does many ways. Help? Yeah, scale does help. Um, I mean, I think Martin and uh, Beggars, they, they dwarf us now. I think within the last two years with the success uh, with Adele, I mean, even for them, they've really pulled away. But I mean, scale and ethos, you know, do combine in companies like that. And so, so I, I guess we would like, I, I'm sort of, I will take the same things that Simon talks about, but I've I've got uh, about 50 or 60 staff, I think. So that's a lot of mouths to feed, but also we have a lot of artists to give our full attention to. So, so really, we just there. There's. I, I, could, I wish I could have more staff to put more service and more attention into all of the artists. But we have big sellers, medium sellers, and small sellers, and so a lot of my day-to-day -day work and operations of the company because uh, I'm a bit of a technocrat really, uh, is, is about providing that service and not forgetting the fact that you know, we, we're, it's, a, it's a form of personal record collection. So there will be artists that we will have not signed in the past because we've already got one like that and we don't want another one. So it's a series of cultural decisions that have to be informed by commerce. Is that the answer? Can, I, can I ask... I don't know whether this is a prickly question or not, but does Don know our masters? Yeah, we do. Um, yeah, no, we, we, we're, we're different to, to, to Simon in that respect. I think that, um, I think there's a mixture of licenses and, and copyrights, um, some very long licenses as well. So that's, I think in, in, in Lawrence, who I work for's case, he feels it's important because he, he feels that he's putting a full emotional commitment and putting a lot of kind of resource into an idea. So he wants the reassurance that if, if something came along, you know, 
if he did a seven year license and then maybe an amazing opportunity came along after ten years, he likes to get the reassurance of having that in place. And, um, but that's, that, that's, that's, that's his personality and our, and our business is, is, is governed by that to a large extent. And uh, whereas we have a publishing company which runs on very small licenses. So, so uh, I saw him the other day and he, he's a bit grumpy at the moment. And, um, you know, it, oh, I don't know what copyright means anymore. So it's, it's very flexible, it moves. Sometimes we, we really feel the benefits of that and other times it, it makes no difference. I think if you're giving an artist its full attention, then it shouldn't make a difference, and that's what we strive to do. You mentioned publishing. Uh, record labels haven't traditionally always owned publishing, or, or larger record labels have had publishing arms that are separate. But I've noticed over the last few years, uh, selling recordings has become now the third biggest way of making money, certainly in the UK, after live and publishing. Is sort of having your tendrils in live and publishing kind of the way that record labels can now make money? It's it's certainly something you have to look at. Um, you know, like like Dom and I have my own publishing uh, set up. It's obviously nowhere near as, as, as large as theirs, but I have a sort of joint venture with a, a company called Blue Mountain Music, which is Chris Blackwell's publishing company. And... Um, it enables me to give a little bit more money to some artists at the start of their career because Bell Union is really 90% about new, about new unsigned artists. We, we, we've recently begun to, to, to do a couple of reissues, things like um, Bandai Parks, and we, we've just recently signed a, a very large band which I can't divulge until the press release goes out in about a week. But, uh, it will be exciting when you do read about it. We'll, we'll um, keep it amongst ourselves, if you want to say Yeah, sure. Yeah, these, these things definitely never go out on Twitter, do they? Um, so, yes, the publishing thing is really important. I think uh, it, it enables us to give that same care and attention to the artist on, on more than just a, a record level. It means I can, work, I can choose who I work with on the sync side. Um, I get particularly involved in, uh, in the film and TV stuff myself. Because obviously, unlike Domino, we don't have a sync department, it's just the four of us in the office. So, um, you know, I think what, what's happened is that I've become um, adaptable in that I, you know, I went from being a musician who knew absolutely nothing about what, what, what a record label does to now at least knowing, you know, a little bit more about all the things that go on. Yes, I'd love to have a booking agency too, because that's really where all the cash is. When I look at all the bands like Fleet Foxes, who I brought over from from Seattle, you know, and played to 200 people in London, and I think what they earn now from their bookings, if I had had a booking agency wing to Bella Union, you know, I'd have a much nicer suit on right now. Is, I mean, we hear about 360 deals, record labels becoming the, the booking agents and the, um, the publishing companies, and, and actually signing deals with artists that are about, you know, essentially, I want a cut of everything. Is, is that an ethical way to make money? Is it a good strategy for a record label to make money? Is it good for bands if they sign up for 360 deals, or does it depend? I'm going to go for depend. Uh, I think, I mean, we don't... We would, I, I would love to do 360 degrees if I had all the services that I know that could compete with all whatever degrees. What do you think live is? You know, that's 90, 180, 120. <laughs> so if I, if I got an amazing agent, you know, then I could do that over 180. But I don't. So, so I don't go after those deals. And I think uh, there's, there's different variants on those deals that you get. You know, if you then go and need tour support, some labels are going in and requesting some sort of sense of override from those things. Um, that's, that's spilling around, but um, I think the publishing thing in terms of creativity is really useful for us and the folks that we work with. If, so if you, are, if you feel yourself to be a label and a publisher, then you can give tracks away more freely. I don't know what it's like here in Spain, but in terms of the UK there's always a paranoia about doing that. You're abusing the trust of the artist in a way, or the artist's relationship with the publisher. So, so actually having both sides, there is a, a creative benefit that instead of just giving music away, you can almost do it with a forward-thinking confidence. So when you're trying to decide if you've got offers around you, that if someone's asking for publishing and label, 
then if you feel that the, the, the person offering you that deal is credible and it's, and it's a fair deal, that would be one of the benefits that they would be, you would be granting. So then it would start to lead a kind of a conversation. What are we doing to actually get music out there? How can we, you know, free form, come up with creative ideas to build up mailing lists and stuff? So, so there's, it just removes le levels of paranoia, which are really, really positive. Yeah, I think there's no there's no conflict of interest if you are successful in in the in the in the in the realm you're moving into. You've got a great sync department, uh, you know, to have control of the band's publishing. It, it, it isn't a conflict of interest. I don't I don't believe. I mean, I, I've seen so many cases where I've been approached by uh, an ad agency or a film or a music supervisor who wanted a, a really quick clearance on a track, and maybe the money was really really good. Which would have meant that a tiny band who maybe sold a couple thousand records, you know, would have been uh, possibly pocketing a hundred, two hundred thousand pounds. I know a couple of examples on my own label where um, one which came off because I was able to act incredibly quickly and within about two hours, I got the manager to give me permission to clear for both publishing and the master, and, and the band ended up with two hundred thousand pound. 100, 100, they own their own publishing, so they, they've got £100,000. And I owned another band where the offer was very, very similar, and because the publishing was with a major, um, and the, uh, the, the, the guy who, who was looking after that particular band was in an LA office, by the time he actually got around to looking at his phone or his email or getting back to me, um, the, the, the offer had gone, and the band and the, the supervisor had moved on to a different track. It's that kind of world now, that world with advertising and film is so fast, it moves literally in minutes. And, and if you don't get, get back to that person very, very quickly, you know, you could lose an incredible opportunity to make your band some money. Um, so I, I think controlling uh, sounds like a very um, manipulative thing to, to, you know, to control publishing and masters, but obviously in those circumstances, it's about making the best of your opportunities. So far we've talked about uh, creative ways of putting together old ways of making money. And we've talked about speeding up old ways of making money. Are there any creative new ways of making money that you guys have come across in your work? Um, well, I mean, I don't know. I think that you could get awfully tautological about it. Uh, I mean, they're, they're evidence around us. I mean, we see it in terms of, you know, is download a new form of money? Is streaming a new form of money? Is different rights ownership a different form of money? It's 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 actually sort of having an impact within the as a label. We're moving from a, a physical dominated world where one piece of information can be controlled by the artist and then disseminated through the people it chooses to work with. Now artists can actually disseminate that work in a network. You know, it's straight through into social networks. So, so really, what all we're doing, I, I don't think we're at that stage, I don't feel that there's a big conversation about where the future is in terms of creativity. I think it's about trying to repatch your, kind of, your, your folks and your mindset, more particularly your mindset, to understand what is inevitable and is going to happen out of your control, and then start to work with it to actually help. Not so much control it, but actually send information through in a, in a really plausible way. So I was talking to Tom earlier this morning about you know, how radio is so fantastic at um, getting excitement into a one song, a, a one track download, and so, so and media is very good at understanding how to support that. And, you know, Tom would also have a, an input, well, it's got to be an amazing song. It doesn't matter what kind of levels of creativity you have. It's still got to be an amazing song. A little bit of extra support and creativity really helps to actually amplify it. Um, but in terms of what we're seeing, I mean, I think the biggest thing, I suppose, is something like streaming and for people to understand streaming. I see within our sales reporting um, within Spotify, Spain is the the third biggest uh, market for us, but it's it's quite different to the other territories because the money is coming from the free tier, from the advertising based tier. So in, you could say in the world you're leading the way 
in terms of marrying up um, advertising to the listening of music. So that's interesting. That's a new one. I, I want to get back to the uh, the media and the radio side of things because you've both got interesting things about, to say about radio. But I want to ask the same question in a slightly different way, which is we've talked about recordings of music and we've talked about live performance of music and we've talked about the publishing of songs. Is there something else where people can make money from music, or is that what we what we have? Are those the ingredients? Well, no. I mean, there's you know there's your screen posters and T-shirts and there's the merch. The merch side, which labels it, you know, trying to dabble in, but it's it's complicated. It's not as easy as, you know, you have to start getting into, you know, making making the t-shirts yourself, making the posters yourself, offering bundles online, uh, obviously to incentivize customers to come to you to buy directly, uh, rather than go to Amazon or rather than go to, uh, you know, HMB or wherever. If, if I want someone to come to my website and sign up to to pre-order the new Beach House album. You know, I'm offering a T-shirt to, to come with the vinyl. Um, so I, I, we're having to be, we're not having to be, we, we want to be more creative in this way because it's, um, you know, these people, these, these fans do really love these artists and I do, I do feel a real strong interaction between uh, fans of the bands on my label uh, and, the, and the bands themselves. You know, it's, it's, it seems very, very close and I think if, 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 if I love Beach House and I go, go to bellyunion.com and I, I pre-order a vinyl, you know, with a t-shirt and a screen print or whatever, and it, and it arrives on time, which is just not always the case, um, you know, that is a beautiful thing, to, to receive stuff through the post still. You know, I don't know about you, but I, I still order an awful lot of vinyl online, and I still get excited when that, that mailer comes knocking at the door, you know. And I, I hope that never that never goes away. I don't think it will. I'm seeing more and more and more people buying vinyl. Um, actually, since we started putting CDs in vinyl, I think our, our sales have increased about three or four hundred percent in the last six months. So that that was obviously a massively good move. Is this something that you can see as a trend? I mean, I'm I'm kind of ruling myself out here because I'm a 45 year old, nearly 45 year old man. Uh, who buys vinyl, loves vinyl. I don't buy CDs, I don't like them very much, but I do buy high quality downloads, uh, like uh, lossless files. I don't like MP3s, all that they, you know, so, but I don't want to kind of universalize from my own experience because basically I'm, I'm you know, I'm an old guy who collects records. And, uh, it, but is there a trend where people are, are buying physical products? Yes, I think so. Yeah. I, I mean, my son was 15 uh, five years ago, and as I sat watching him, on his laptop, downloading a million songs from LimeWire, I thought, well, we're fucked. We, we, we've got nothing. We, if he's doing it, then every kid at his school is doing it, and every kid in the world is doing it. Now, fast forward five years into the future, what would you imagine that 15-year-old that is doing now as a 20-year-old? Well, he's in jail, surely. <laughs> he should be. Uh, it's my son, he should be in jail. Uh, no, he's, he wouldn't dream of downloading a piece of music for free now. He thinks it's ridiculous, it's boring. He, spent, you know, he works and he saves up his money and he buys vinyl. I could never have predicted that happening. And if it's happening in my household, I'm sure it's happening in, in plenty of other... Uh, households with, with, with fathers of teenagers. Well, he's clearly grown up in a house that is kind of at least sympathetic to music, but you do have this kind of thing where if people are that enthusiastic about getting and hearing and finding out about who they are through music, they're probably going to end up being music fans. Well, well, music well I, I would want to say that um, you would think that because I'm who I am, and you would assume he had a certain intelligence about downloading and, and the legality of it and vinyl and stuff, but actually that isn't the case. You know, he's his own man and he makes his own decisions. We don't talk about that stuff at all. So I don't want to sort of say this is a special case and, you know, uh, here's a child that just happens to be the son of me. Uh, you know, I really think that he is typical of, of a lot of kids of that generation because his friends are all doing it too. So uh, that encourages me an awful lot. Well, it encourages me too because you, you hear these stories about, you know, devalued music, when in actual fact these people, are, uh, you know, at a young age are kind of, Omnivores, down yeah, but you know, you have to remember, you have to go back to that age yourself. When, you, when you're 15, you've got no money, you don't have a credit card, you don't have a job. You can't afford to go buy music, so you either, you know, steal a pound off your brother and you go and buy a seven-inch single in, in, in Woolworths or whatever, uh, or you wait, or you, and then as you get older, you become bored of just having everything there. You, you want to go and seek out something different, and you become a collector. 
as we all get older, we all start collecting things. And I don't think uh, that's changing just because kids listen to music on iPods or kids have Spotify accounts. I don't think it automatically means physical product is dead. Well, I really hope not. But my personal experience is, is that it isn't. It sounds like you're saying that we've spent the last five or ten years training a massive, massive consumer base of really rabid music fans. Is that kind of your experience, John? Um, kind, kind of. I mean, I think just the opportunities to purchase in different ways that suit people's kind of habits, really. I mean, I think, you know, I, I think there are certain things that are sort of society issues more than actually issues that we can control. So. I always thought that we might sell more records in continental Europe due to cheap, uh, cheap airlines more than our own promotional efforts because we could get our artists to encourage them to go and turn up in another city, in another town and actually get someone to fall in love with them rather than just send a video through. So, so I think that people will continue to buy physical goods. Um, I think it's more likely that they'll buy them in vinyl with a CD in is a great idea. Um, I think that CD as a mass market format might still exist for you know, albums that get in the top 10 or the top 20, but I don't think that we'll be manufacturing CDs really in five years' time that much. I think that vinyl will come up a bit, and I think if you put downloads or CDs in them, then I think that, that interoperability um, you get that as a translator, that, that ability to, um, you know, buy something but then use it for the car or take it into the home or pop it on your iPad. You, if you've got all of that worked out for the audience, then people will say, oh, that's good, that's easy. So we've literally been having to intellectualise that for quite, you know, for the last 10 years. Whereas now, people around me, who you call them digital natives, they come into work in our businesses and they don't have to intellectualise it like we are. I mean, you know, I mean, I know we're high quality people and all that kind of thing, but, but really there's a load of this stuff where you go, what are you talking about? You know, it, what, it's just evidence. So, so, so really then, if you look at the statistics, if you want to get into dry stuff within our business, if you look at our, our sales within iTunes, again I was saying this to Tom earlier, the 80% of all our sales within iTunes are at a track level. You would, we would love everyone to buy whole albums. Physical does that, so that's sort of a request, will you buy the whole album? We would love that, but actually the consumer wants to possibly buy just the one song, or the three songs, or the five songs. So then a creative response would be to that is to then work out, well, if you bought three, you know, people on like iTunes, they go around and say, well, complete your album. So you have to start rewiring your, your head to these things. And so I will do snapshot, this is all a bit boring, isn't it? But the, um, I will do, I'll have a look at our... Sorry, no, not at all. I'll have a look at, <laughs> yeah, thanks. That was, it should have been quick. Yeah. The, um, so we'll look at a month and we'll work out where our big artists, how much... So I would say about 50% of all our income within iTunes, shouldn't be telling you this really, um, is, is from the big boys. And then 50% of the rest is from the rest of our catalogue. But if you go into streaming, um, I, that percentage changes again. I would say that 70% of all the income within streaming is from the whole range, from the from that roster, that 50% moves down to 30%. So the longer tail, I've never really believed in the longer tail until I saw the stuff that we see within Spotify. So that's really interesting. And I think there are some themes and trends that you can start to identify and then start to ask questions of your staff and make requests of your artists to start to think about what does that mean to them and what does it mean to their audience. Okay, I've, um, I'm, since we've brought our offspring into this, I'm going to um, briefly introduce my son Jake, who's 19, uh, who's a dubstep producer, and the reason I bring him up is we've talked about how to make money as a record label, but the, the topic of the panel is creative ways to make money in the music industry, and the reason I bring him up is he does pretty much everything else, 
He works for music festivals, he writes for music magazines, he runs a blog where he uh, curates music uh, and puts stuff out there, he makes mixtapes, he, he just put out a sixth album on Bandcamp, and he doesn't see the point of record labels, doesn't know what they're for. Um, and, and that kind of raises the question of, if you were giving advice to a 19 year old who's just getting started in the music industry, in terms of, okay, how do I make my career at this, what do you tell them? I think just continue to do that. I, I mean, I think there's sometimes a moment where this. I, th I presume that labels existed, you know, 50 years ago because there was lots of things that an artist didn't want to do, and then labels are, in theory, meant to be good at. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the options out there for you as a musician are so enormous. Um, I, 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 I think this idea of sort of giving things away for free on Bandcamp or whatever is. It's fine if you if you have a fan base, but I um, you know as a marketing tool because you know somebody like Trent Reznor has been doing it for years and giving his music away for free, but he, he can, can't he? Because he can go and play a show and make a million pounds. Radiohead's the same. It's 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 these people can do smart things, but what do, what do brand new bands do? How do how do they get their head above the parapet and, and let people know that they're out there? It's it's. I think it's retarded to, 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 to give music away for free if you're if you're a new artist because who, who's going to hear it? Um, who's going to hear it if you don't? Well, that's the, that's, the, that's the same old question that you'd ask anyway. Uh, you know, you, you, it has to be great music. You have to be thoughtful. You have to get it to radio. I think we haven't, we started talking about radio and we didn't quite get it. Let's there. talk about radio because that's really interesting. You're both doing radio. I, I, I personally think that the, the, the radio stations are doing what A and R people used to do. And I think they are the most important people out there right now. Um, stations like, uh, well, obviously, you know, the BBC is still still fantastic over in the UK um, for for introducing great great music. There's a wonderful gentleman here in the front row who's spent uh, many years supporting brand new music and continues to do a grand, incredible job for us. Um, and I, I think they are the new A&R because they're the ones that want to play a brand new band before anybody else. The, de the desire to seek out new music, it burns very brightly in me, and it burns very brightly in people like Tom Robinson and, and others, um, because we, we, we want to listen, we want to hear something we haven't heard before. And I, I think you're finding stations like Amazing Radio, where an artist can upload a brand new track, start an artist page in, in literally one minute, upload a piece of music which will then be available to stream or to download and the money, 100% of the money will go directly to the artist. Within a few seconds, a brand new artist has set themselves up with the potential to make money. And that's what we're talking about in terms of creative ways to make money in the music business. Well, that's, a, that's one we haven't talked about yet and that's something that I think will be the future. Ones and ones of pounds every single time they get played. Well, you, you know, you can mock it, but if you, if you get if you get if you get if you get if you're playlists um, on a station like that, it's very it's very soon before six music pick up on it or Radio One pick up on it, and then all of a sudden the record labels are knocking at your door saying, "Wow, I heard your track on blah blah blah. I think this is a really interesting man." Then all of a sudden, you know, this one seventy nine pence can turn into. Seventy-nine pounds, which can then turn into a hundred fifty quid gig, which the following month can turn into a thousand pound gig. Is that um, the answer for for a, a new band? Is is just wait for the day where a record label knocks on the door and says, "We're here to save you. We can make you money. Stick with me, kids." No, 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 not at all. Um, no, not at all. I think that I think I think that's the difficult. I mean, I, I I know I know that our label has a relevance uh, that will continue for the next. 50 years, 100 years, but its relevance could be as an archive. I mean, but our primary function in life is to get excited about new music. So, so really, the only thing that's under threat now is actually our ability to hire enough of those skills and services to, to actually give that to artists and give that to their, their campaigns. And, and probably... You know, an artist probably should be capable of, you know, doing some of those first things themselves. And really, if they want to do that and also control that and actually get off on doing all of the the, the, the mechanics of the role, like I, I have a word for it called implementation. If you put all the things into practice, if you know how to link 
Facebook links through to iTunes and do that in 34 different countries and you like doing that, then you should continue doing that. If you have the faith to actually sort of, if you're going to have a creative urge that will be able to be fulfilled by your own system, then you should continue doing that. That's one of the wonderful things of the, the but, network. But not everyone function. is like that. Not everyone no, is exactly. like your son. Some people need a backup system. Some people need some advice, some help, some creative ideas that go beyond their own, you know. A team. Yeah, some people love that, you know. And so there should be many different models. I'm not saying one's any better than the other. It's great that there are many different models. It's the best thing about well, it sounds like, right now. It sounds like, rather than there being a recipe for being creative to make money now, it's an entrepreneurial space. This is there are opportunities to make money rather than there are you know formulas. Would that be fair? Yeah, I think that's fair. I think to actually sort of see it through the through the traditional label idiom, then you know that's really hard to sort of say. Well, what else can labels do? I mean, this the, there are certain elements that the label does really well, and I think. There are certain elements where artists and tour managers and live promoters and agents do really well. They do it better than us. And some of it is, uh, and, it's, and we're better to stay out of those areas until you can do them really well. And it's better for promoters to stay out of label areas because they do them really well. So, so it's, there's still that sort of segregation, but what the beauty is, is there's, there's, it's like a buffet now. You know, surely as an artist, you know, you've got it. You know, you've got the bullet. Just get on and do it. So, I mean, we talked about it. You know, there are certain things. If you're not very good, then you're buggered. So, whether you like it or not, so so one be amazing. You've got to be fantastic, and then to cut through, it does really help to be fantastic. And I'm sure labels can still muck that up for you. But, um, but, but really. I w again, I was, I was talking about it earlier, and there are fellas down my road who will spend, you know, 5,000, 10,000 quid on doing up their car, and that's their hobby, and then they're not complaining at the car industry about, you know, how come I can't make a living in the car industry? Now, I shouldn't be saying stuff like that, but, but you know, if you're, you've got to make fantastic music, and then look after yourself and be very aware of all the opportunities. And so, you know, we can sit down under our advisors and lawyers. They're actually able to send you in the right directions. There's not a lack of infrastructure for all these ideas. But there is a lack of understanding about quality. And there has to be an amazing quality. As much as the, the, there's been a massive interruption in uh, the, the means of physical distribution and sales, the, that's lost within it is the is the memory that somehow you've got to be really good. You've got to be really good in this. You have to be better than ever before. I think that's really interesting that, that you raise the idea of the, uh, the, the car hobbyist uh, in the sense that this doesn't have to be a way in which you make a living. I mean, there are lots of people who can now make records and put them out who aren't in brackets in the music industry, if you like. Uh, they, they are hobbyists, they put music out, they share it with people, and it doesn't necessarily have to be how they make their living anymore. Yeah, no, absolutely, and but then, you know, you can go to TuneCore in, in the States and send your album in, and you can have it available in every download service in the world, and then sometimes there is also, you know, you can rewire that the other way around, you can work with someone like The Orchard that will also then make your physical available. So it's almost like the folks with the digital are now taking over the keys of the physical dudes. So so really you can do all of that, no problem at all. But but if you really what a label does is meant to organise, so timeline management, implementation, setting up all the kind of the ideas of how to cope when you have your creativity, how you you pace it into the market. Labels should be really good at that. They're the kind of conversations that we will have all day long. And then the other thing is cutting through at a promotional level. So those artists that get to five or 10,000 sales worldwide might turn around and say, I'm not doing that anymore. I want to work with someone else who can do that on my behalf. And that's the role of labor.
Can I flip this on, on its head a little bit? Because uh, we've been talking about creative ways to make money in the music industry, but there are actually now creative ways to spend less money in the music industry. As, as a band, let's say Cocktail Twins, I don't know what your advance was, but let's, for the sake of argument, say it was a quarter of a million pounds. You don't have to start by spending quarter of, you know, but, but people do spend quarter of a million pounds on making records. <laughs> Quarter of a million pounds. But people do spend. Martin Mills yeah. giving me a quarter of a million pounds. No, it's not a gift, it's a loan. That's the problem with an advance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and no, you don't have to pay that. But, that's, but, but what I'm saying is you don't have to spend as much money as you used to in order to make a record. Things that, 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 um, you know, things have changed massively. Actually, the first oh, it's a shame that you didn't get given a quarter of a million pounds. No, it's, it's a great shame. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the first Cox of Twins record actually cost 900 pounds. There. there you have it. And it recouped in about three minutes. So. That's how to make. That's how to make money. You know, don't spend a ridiculous amount of money at the beginning, and then uh, you know, m m the whole ethos of Bella Union uh, it runs up. Run, uh, part of the reason I set up the label is because I wanted to be run a label that I would like to have been signed to. Um, and I think as artists, there's nothing more uncomfortable than feeling uh, than looking at your uh, looking at a royalty statement and realizing how unrecouped you are. And I, I know so many artists that feel that pressure being paid a huge advance and quite often when a band is paid a huge advance it's usually by a major and uh, more often than not those records don't even come out or, or sit on the shelf for years and uh, we, we all hear the horror stories of bands careers that have been ruined that way um i, I don't i've never had that kind of money to throw throw, throw around as a record label nor, nor would i if i had it um, and i find that most artists feel more comfortable and more able to create in an environment where money isn't actually discussed an awful lot um, because I certainly didn't get into the music, in, uh, you know, become a musician with, with, with the thought of making, make, making money. That wasn't, my, that wasn't particularly my motivation at all. Um, and I, I suppose when I see how easy it is for bands to make music nowadays um, and how cheap it is, I'm really pleased. Because, you know, A, it means that I'm not, you know, having to fork out huge amounts of recording costs, but also I know that when the band manufacture their first record when we when we make that first album for the band we're probably you know not massively unrecouped before we've actually started because you have to remember that everything's an upfront cost before you make a before you make a record your video you've got to make you know the artwork uh, you know buying equipment for the band putting them in the studio manufacturing a record you know it can be anything between a few thousand and you know twenty thousand pounds before you've even put the record into the shops and that's a massive investment to make and over the years that investment has had to come back investment just naturally has come down an awful lot and that's a great thing bands literally can make a record at home on their garage band press a button and within five minutes have it distributed around the world that's all well and good that's not particularly my why i'm not on the planet i'm, I'm not i'm not on the planet for that reason but i can see that that is a great model for other people <laughs> I'm going to uh, flip this on its head a little bit as well, because we do have a little bit of time for questions, but actually what I'd like to do is tap the collective wisdom and uh, make the first question one to the audience. Uh, can anybody give me some good examples of creative ways in which people have been making money? I know Tom is bound to have them, so I'm going to start with them, but uh, hopefully this will be a, a seed for us generally.